then I don't need the preamble if there are no um, public attendees. Um, we can just uh, get started. I'll uh, call to order the April 12th meeting of the East Penn Board of School Directors. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. First order of business is the roll call for attendance. Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll please? Ms. Bowman. Present. Mr. Bird. Here. Mr. Champagne. Here. Mr. Jankowski. Present. Dr. Levinson. Here. Dr. Munson. Present. Mr. Smith. Here. Ms. Winch. Here. Dr. Bacher. Here. All present. Uh, next is a request to address the board and we have none and there are no uh, public attendees. So we'll move on to uh, approval of minutes from the March 22nd meeting. I have a motion, please. So moved, Bowman. Evanson, second. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Bird. Aye. Mr. Champagne. Aye. Mr. Jankowski. Aye. Dr. Levinson. Aye. Dr. Munson. Aye. Mr. Smith. Aye. Ms. Winch. Aye. Ms. Bowman. Aye. Dr. Bacher. Aye. Nine ayes. Motion passes. Uh, moving on to presentations. We have a, a preliminary budget update. Uh, Mrs. Campbell and Mr. Saul. Yes, thank you for, for giving me a minute just to get the presentation uploaded. So this evening, our administrative team will be providing the board with an update of our 2021-22 preliminary budget. Specifically, Mr. Saul is going to provide our team with an overview of adjustments that have been made to the revenues and expenditures. After Mr. Saul does his component of the budget updates, we will take a break at that point in the presentation and ask the board to, to um, ask, allow the board to ask any financial questions that they might have specifically about those budget updates. And then several members of our administrative team will continue with the presentation and provide an update of several expenditure items, specifically looking at several personnel positions as well as programs. As a brief reminder, um, we always like to share with the board and begin our budget conversations with just an overview of the guiding principles that have really been at the forefront of our budget process, our budget planning process for the upcoming school year. Specifically, you can see that um, we're looking to restore our building and department budgets to levels that they were pre-pandemic. We are also looking for continued program growth through supporting our student learning needs as well as social and emotional wellness through the need for additional staffing as well as programming. And then also we're going to talk briefly about some curriculum resources. I will provide an update on those items as well. And so at this point, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Mr. Saul, who's gonna uh, provide that budget update for us. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, we have conducted a thorough review of the 2021-22 budget and updated the revenues and expenditures. The long range fiscal plan that was included on the agenda that stated April 12th, 2021 uh, has been updated to reflect these changes. And I'll just work down through the um, slide here and talk about these items. As discussed during the March 22nd board meeting presentation, we updated the budget to reflect a one-time transfer 
of funds during the current fiscal year from the general fund to the capital reserve fund in the amount of $10 million. The reason for this transfer uh, is several. First, it'll lower the general fund balance by setting aside funds to help address future capital needs. It represents a one-time expenditure via a transfer, which eliminates the possibility of creating a structural deficit while using the funds. And we believe the facilities condition study that will be conducted this summer will identify needs that are beyond the scope of our capital projects plan that's included in the long range plan on pages 30 and 31. Next, we updated uh, revenue line items, including the real estate tax uh, millage rate. It has been decreased from the Act 1 index rate of 3.6% to 3.0%, reducing revenues by $551,000. Also, we lowered the state social security reimbursement and state retirement reimbursement line items. You'll recall in the past that I've talked about the relationship between our uh, the, our social security and retirement benefit expenses and the fact that we get 50% reimbursement from the state. So this is a reflection of the fact that the uh, FICA, sorry, social, Secu social security and, re re and retirement expenses are lower, thereby we're getting lower reimbursement from the state. In terms of expenditure adjustments, again, with a thorough review of the, of the budget, uh, employee wages are decreased, uh, $250,000. Employee benefits, $222,000. Uh, LCTI tuition is very small, but just to bring that in alignment with the numbers that are budgeted by LCTI, a reduction of $144. The consumable math resources, you'll recall in a prior presentation, we discussed the possibility of uh, paying for these using grant funding. Uh, so we've removed them from the budget and we will uh, we we're proposing to use grant funding. Finally, a reduction of the budgetary reserve in the amount of $35,000. I will remind the board that when we look at the long range plan, the summary sheet, um, we reverse the, the budgetary reserve line item. Therefore, this $35,000 change doesn't really affect the quote bottom line or the fund balance at the end of the year but it was a change to keep the, the um, budgetary reserve at that 5% mark. On the next uh, series of slides, we can observe the impact of these changes. And these contain uh, selected pages from the long range and fiscal, long range fiscal and capital plan. On the, the slide that's uh, in front of us here, which is page five of the plan, the summary, we can see on cell H20. So if you look at, uh, column H, which is the current year estimates, 21, 2020, 2021, um, row 20, you can see the addition of the um, suggested transfer to budgetary reserve. If you go on down that column to row 30, you see that we've gone from a net positive position at the end of the year to a deficit position, again, related to the transfer of those funds. And then finally on row 39, you can see the projected ending fund balance has gone from uh, in excess of 20 million to roughly 13 and a half million, which is approximately 9% of the anticipated expenditures or one month of um, operating expenditures. For reference purposes, this is similar to about five years ago in 2016-17. Uh, however, at that time, we had a very small capital reserve fund, and we, uh, we would have a very robust capital reserve fund in this scenario. And the next column, which is the 21-22 proposed, if we, yeah, if we could just stand that slide, thank you. And the next column, 21-22 proposed, again, I would just point out on row 30, so this is column I, row 30, that the budget does propose a slightly under a $1 million structural deficit which has the impact of spending down some of the fund balance. I can say that given the, the, some of the circumstances in the budget related to, um, if you recall the transportation, which is going to be reduced for one year and the um, higher charter uh, expenses, we believe that those will, be go, will reduce in future years. 
um, there's opportunity for this structural deficit to be removed in future years. And in fact, you can see through modeling um, that future years look much better. On the next slide, we can see the past and present relationship between the Act One index and the enacted, or uh, in, in the case of next year, the proposed tax increase. You can see, as we discussed, the, the, the Act One index was 3.6%, and we are right now at a 3% increase. You can also see that the five-year average millage rate increase with a 3% that's in the, currently in the budget is 1.6%, and the 10 year average millage increase is what just 1.9% we'll call it. On the next slide, we can see uh, the effect of the, the proposed transfer on the capital reserve fund. At the, the bottom half of this is the budget for the capital reserve fund. If you look at column I, again, row 32, you can see the effect of the, the, the revenue uh, recording of the $10 million transfer. And if we go down to row 49 in that same column, you can see that it now reflects a $13 million uh, balance. Again, we believe that um, setting these, sides, these funds aside will be very helpful in addressing the needs that are identified uh, in the study that will be done this summer. On the next slide, I try to just identify a couple of items that will continue to affect the budget as we move forward. Those will be real estate assessment changes that we receive in April and May. Um, any employee retirements, actually any employee turnover that we would be aware of. Um, our property liability workers compensation and insurance premiums, typically when we receive those, we'll adjust our um, estimates to the, to the actuals and then possibly charter and cyber tuition adjustments. Um, we certainly continue to monitor our current year enrollment to project enrollment for next year. So there is the possibility um, of adjustments in that line item as well. So I, that actually brings us to the end of the short uh, fiscal update. It really is an update. We spent a lot of time previously discussing uh, much of this information. So these are just updates regarding the figures. So at this point, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I also welcome feedback regarding the direction um, that, that budget development is moving. Ms. Bowman. Yeah, um, thank you. I just have two questions and one is mostly to refresh my memory. Um, can you remind me if you kept the state funding flat or if you used a 2% increase for that? The state funding is flat. Um, I really, act, after the last presentation, we, we discussed that a little bit, you may recall, and I, I thought long and hard about it. I actually thought about updating it. Uh, last Friday, uh, the, the area business officials met with uh, members of the General Assembly, both senators and, and, and representatives, and um, it's, 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 I think, very clear that there is not an appetite in the General Assembly to increase um, education funding this year for the basic ed and special education line items. It should be clear about that. Okay, um, so there might be some changes to other things like um, cyber school tuition, things like that, but um, uh, we don't, you, you won't, won't even know that's gonna be a question mark until at least June, is that correct? Um, I would say <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I just, I'm only asking because you didn't have it listed as one of the items of things that might change. So um, right. I just, I was just curious if, if it was moving into a category of something that you were actually counting on. Um, and then my next question um, you mentioned about the, why you were comfortable with the 1 million deficit. And I, I wasn't sure if I completely followed the logic on that. And I'm just wondering if you can break it down a little more. Usually when we have a structural deficit one year, the, the warning is that the next year it'll be twice as big. Um, and so what is it about the two um, items that you mentioned, the bus transportation and cyber charter that you feel like that budget hole will close all like naturally? Sure, the, the transportation is the reimbursement from the state. And if you recall, when we reviewed the revenues, um, because of the reduced 
transportation expenses in the current year, we anticipate the um, reimbursement next year will be lower. And then the following year, it would increase. And so it's, a, it's potentially a one year dip and then it will return. And so that sort of corresponds to this one year, hopefully one year structural deficit. Um, similarly, we hope that we're budgeting um, the cyber tuition at a higher level and those students will begin to return and that would come down as well. So the, the increased revenues in the future year and the decreased expenditures in the future year would close that um, structural deficit gap. Okay, and, and you're expecting, uh, I know usually you budget um, fairly conservatively. So um, would you say that what you're expecting in terms of a year from now, that million dollar hole will disappear? Would you call that a conservative expectation or is that, um, I don't know, does it, is it a little bit mixed with wishful thinking that a, a whole bunch of students will come back to us? I think it's a reasonable expect, expectation. Um, I, I'm, I'm fairly confident that the transportation piece will restore. And if you okay. remember, that was pretty, pretty significant. It wasn't a million dollars, but it was, you know, a little over half million dollars. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the tuition we're up right now, 1.5 million in terms of our um, cyber tuition. So if we got a third of those students to come back um, okay. based, on, based on what we've budgeted for next year. Okay, but that's helpful. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, Dr. Levinson. Thank you, Dr. Bacher. Um, so Mr. Stahl, Mr. Stahl, you asked for some, some and feedback on, on the direction that's headed. So I'd just like to uh, um, support the fact that uh, we, we went from 3.6 to 3.0 for the real estate tax increase. I think that's a, that's a good direction. Um, and again, as, as the picture becomes clearer and pencils become sharper, hopefully we, we can again chip, chip away at that. Um, I'd also like to express support for the allocation of uh, extra fund balance funds to the capital reserve fund. I do think that the, the three um, areas that, that, that uh, you listed for supporting uh, having you know, some extra funds in the capital reserve fund do make sense. And, and I am anticipating as you are uh, the potential for our facility study to identify uh, capital needs. So um, again, I, I, I thank you for the, uh, the continued update and, uh, and um, you know, I, I do, I do like where the direction that we're headed here. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback as well, Mr. Champagne. Yes, I was going to respond in a similar manner that Dr. Levinson just said. You know, the direction obviously is in a in a, in a good sense going the way I think people would like to see it, and at the same time, we're able to hold the line on a number of other things that we need to ensure, like the capital reserve. I, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, regarding insurance, Bob, do you have any insights as to how that might come out? You know, you, we saw you know a substantial increase in the health insurance. Our our insurance rates for other products uh, seeing similar kind of spike given the pandemic and and just general in cost increases. Or or do you have any idea how, how that might come about? Sure, it varies a little bit. Um, we've de we're definitely seeing a hardening of the of the market. Um, especially in the area of cyber liability, um, which there could be significant increases um, due to, you know, during the pandemic, there's been a high reliability on, on um, remote working, and certainly that has lent itself to certain cyber crimes. And so um, cyber liability is one place where I think the, the market is going to be very hard. Um, our general property uh, liability insurance is, is probably gonna be moderate, uh, definitely not to the extent that we uh, saw with the health insurance um, and moderate, uh, probably 5%, three to 5% we'll say. And um, workers' compensation is actually uh, projected to, to, to remain, I don't wanna say flat because there's always our own experience modifier that will play into that but that um, market is certainly not experiencing the types of increases that we're seeing in, in the others. 
Well, how much do we actually spend on all these other insurance products? I can't recall. Is it a big? It's, it's about a quarter of a million dollars. All right, so it's not a big swing in, in terms of the budget, in terms of how things could go up or down in terms of millage rate or so forth. It, let me clarify, quarter of a million dollars for the non-workers comp compensation insurances. Workers comp, I would need to look here real quick. Um, workers comp is... Um, roughly in itself is roughly 360. Um, in the current year, we're budgeting 36, 396. Um, and there's a possibility, hopefully we can reduce that when we get our actual renewals. Okay. But yeah, again, it's not a huge swing. It's not going to, you know, no. and then I, I you know, I, I applaud the administration for, you know, looking at ways to take some of these one-time expenditures like the, the math resources and move it to the grant funding and so forth. Do you think there's opportunities within the budget for other, uh, you know, purchases like that, that we can look to maybe move out of, you know, general expenditures and use the grant funding? And can that be, will that be incorporated as you kind of revolve through the budget in the next several iterations? I think the two concerns with that, is there a possibility? Yeah, I think there's always that possibility. I think our concern as an administration is twofold. One is um, if we're removing expenditures that are recurring expenditures, we want to be very careful about how many of those we remove. Um, you know, here it's roughly a quarter of a million dollars we've already removed that will need to be um, picked up by the general fund in the future. Um, so that's the first thing is we just need to be cognizant of, of to what extent we want to do that and what impact that will have in the future. The other, um, the other thing, and I've said this, you know, in the past is we really um, philosophically believe that those funds should be used for those remediation activities. And it's my understanding that um, there's a presentation slated for the, the next board meeting that will begin to talk about that. So we, we really have tried to hold off on um, um, earmarking those grant funds for other things until we have a handle on the remediation program, because we feel strongly that that's the first priority. Well, I would agree with that. I'm, I'm just looking at it, you know, obviously the math resources, are, you know, something that we will have to budget for in the future, but it, it's not like you have to budget for it every year because it, it does have a shelf life of certain, a certain number of years. And, you know, you can, and I'm just looking to see if there are some other things like that as you go through the exercise on figuring out what those grant funds should be used for in terms of remediation, that we take advantage of any other opportunities we think with, within reason that don't require us to then in, several, in, in a year or so suddenly have to come up with a big pot of money. Okay. Sure. That's all my time. I did just want to clarify one, one statement. Unlike the reading resources, which we purchased in the past, which were, you know, as you described, have a long shelf life because we purchased the book, it's available for students to use. These math resources are actually consumable resources. We, we you know, traditionally we would refer to these as the workbooks that go with the textbook. Um, and so I just wanted to clarify that this actually is a recurring expense because it's the, it's the book that's handed to each student to use throughout the year, it's written in and it. So it is a consumable item. Um, and I, I just, I that. wanted to clarify that for the Thank board. Thank you, I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'm sorry, thank you, Mr. Champagne. Um, I would also like to echo my colleagues that I appreciate the, the direction of the, uh, uh, the budget and uh, all your ongoing uh, work uh, through this process. So thank you. Thank you. Moving on to Mrs. Campbell's. Great, thank you. I, I wanted to, before we dive into the details of some of the positions and the programs, this is a slide that the board and the community has seen before. In particular, this slide summarizes the restorations for which we're planning for the upcoming budget cycle. And so, um, before we get into the highlighted positions, which really will be for the focus for the second half of our presentation, I just wanted to provide an update in terms of, um, you can see there we have reduced the summer maintenance and tech staff budget. 
Um, and those are, those are that staff that supports work that happens over the summer, specifically in terms of our building maintenance, as well as working with technology. We are planning to restore those summer programs. We just um, are able to reduce that amount by about $100,000. And so again, it's still, we're still including to, we're still planning to include those services for this summer. Um, the, the amount that we need is just a bit less than we had originally budgeted earlier in the budget process. Um, the other piece, and this is just a reiteration of the conversation that um, Mr. Saul just had with regard to the ready math resources, which is really an annual purchase. But at this point in time, we do feel comfortable pulling that $220,000 out of the budget and instead using grant monies to fund the 2021-22 annual expenses for those resources. So the focus of our, the remainder of our presentation then really will be to talk about the proposed restoration of the elementary position, the secondary position, as well as the social emotional learning program. And so we'll start with first with the elementary teaching position. Um, and as of right now, this position is in the budget as a placeholder. And what I mean by that is, as of today, April 12th, I cannot, we cannot identify exactly where, meaning in which building or which grade level this position might be needed. However, um, you might recall last year, we actually reduced the budget by two elementary teaching positions. And there are a variety of factors, some of which are unique to this year or the upcoming year, I should say, that our administrative team really feels it's important that we um, are prudent in our budgeting process and actually include an elementary position for which we might have a need. And some of those factors are, um, first, we have to continue to monitor our enrollment at the elementary level. And as Mr. Saul described, we do have plans to connect with all of our East Penn families who have made an who made the option this year to withdraw their elementary students from East Penn schools and instead enroll them in a cyber charter school. And so recognizing the uniqueness of this particular year and the variety of um, decisions or, or factors that went into that decision to withdraw from East Penn and instead attend the cyber charter, we really would like to do our very best job to have those families return to our East Penn schools. And so um, again, through those recruitment efforts, we are optimistic that we'll be able to return some of our elementary students to our classrooms. And so therefore we have to continue to monitor those enrollments in our seven buildings in each of those sections. The other piece, and this is something that um, we have to continue to monitor every school year, in particular, as you know, our kindergarten registration, um, I'll put in a little plug that it's, it's an online process and it is currently open and so we encourage our families to continue to register. Um, the sooner families register and we have those registrations firmed up, the better position we are in as an organization to plan for the total number of kindergarten sections that we will need. And so again, this really is intended to be a placeholder so that as we monitor those factors, we can be prepared and have the position ready to go and approved in the budget, um, rather than having to come to the board after the budget is approved, asking for additional elementary positions. The next position that I wanted to revisit is, and I say revisit because you might recall um, earlier this fall, we did provide the board with an introduction to the need for a secondary position. And so I'll start off by saying, um, as a reminder, last spring, we reduced our high school position, our high school teaching positions by four. Um, and so we are looking to restore one of those positions. And specifically, we have, um, we are proposing that that position would actually be a reading seminar instructor. Instru and you can see the specific skill set that we are looking for in terms of the candidate who would fill that position. Specifically, the individual, the reading seminar teacher would be the teacher who is ultimately responsible for that reading seminar course that is currently offered in our high school program of studies. And we have identified a need for the reading seminar course, which is designed to be 
a reading intervention course for students at Emmaus High School. Currently, we have literacy interventions in place at the elementary level. We also have a reading seminar course, which is an intervention type course at the middle level. And so you can see we there is a need or a deficit of such a course at the high school level. And the reading seminar instructor would be the individual who's then responsible for that course. When we think about the vision for the reading seminar course, you see language on here in terms of that particular course is designed to be a tier two intervention. And I wanna explain that, um, what we mean by a tier two intervention. First of all, we would have any student who would be eligible for the reading seminar course would first and foremost also be taking their grade level English course. And so all students, the expectation is that they would still get what we refer to in education is that core instruction or the grade level English course that they should be getting. So if they're a ninth grader, they would still take their ninth grade English course. We also recognize that some students have, based on assessment information or assessment data, we know that, though, that there are some students who demonstrate a need for additional instruction or intervention. There are deficits in their learning or mastery of specific skills. And so those students at Emmaus High School, this reading seminar course is then what's referred to as tier two, or it's an additional deeper layer of instruction that they would have in addition to their grade level course. So the reading seminar course is designed for to be a half semester. Um, and certainly we would I, we are in the process of having clear entrance as well as exit criteria. In particular, when we talk about the entrance or the criteria that we're looking at for students who might be eligible and in need of such an intervention course, we are looking at a variety of district screening assessments, again, so that we can par target the population for which this course is most appropriate. As we continue the assessment process throughout the spring, we will be able to come back and provide the board with an update in terms of the um, actual course enrollment for the reading seminar course at the high school. And at this point, I am thrilled to be able to um, turn the program, turn the presentation over to um, two members of our East Penn team, Mrs. Michelle James, who's our K-5 STEM supervisor, and, al and also Mrs. Noelle Gesick, who is a district psychologist. And they are two leaders from our social emotional learning committee at the district, and are, they are excited to share with you an overview of the work that our team has been doing in SEL and to talk to you about the need um, for such a program in our organization. Thank you, Mrs. Campbell. Again, I am Michelle James, and on behalf of the entire Social Emotional Learning Committee, Ms. Noelle Gessick and I are happy to present the committee's progress to date, as well as our future plans to promote social emotional learning in our schools. I'd like to first provide you with a brief summary of our work. During the 2020-21 school year, our committee convened to build background in the areas of trauma-informed practices and social emotional learning. As a committee, we agreed to first focus, focus on trauma-informed care. Through grant funding, we were able to collaborate with Lakeside Neurological Initiative to provide trauma-informed professional learning to our faculty and staff with specialized training for core team members, including school counselors and psychologists. As we continue to support trauma-informed practices as an organization, our plan is to build on these efforts to further develop social emotional programming for our students. So to date, we have mainly responded to our students' mental health concerns reactively, providing many supports and services to address their needs. Moving forward, we would like to implement social emotional learning curricula in order to proactively provide our students with the tools necessary to be resilient and to adapt positively in the face of adversity. As part of tonight's presentation, Noelle and I will share the vision for social emotional learning, as well as our plans for data collection, professional learning, 
program selection, and implementation timelines. So first and foremost, it's important that we have a common understanding of what social emotional learning or SEL actually is. According to CASEL, which is the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, SEL is the process through which all young people and adults acquire and apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to develop healthy identities, manage emotions, and achieve personal and collective goals, feel and show sympathy for others, establish and maintain supportive relationships, and make responsible and caring decisions, which is kind of a mouthful there. But ultimately, a key focus of SEL is to promote positive development through the fostering of social and emotional skills that form the foundation of mental well being and success in life. Um, important skills include understanding and managing emotions and behaviors, solving personal and interpersonal problems, building healthy coping strategies, and developing self esteem and confidence. And I think never has this been more important than than what we're going through right now. While most SEL programs and activities focus on developing skills in individuals, they have also been shown to be effective in helping to create safe and caring school climates and classrooms where being compassionate, respectful, and supportive is valued and expected. The kind of environments that promote the mental well being of all students and support the needs of children at risk. It's important to note that mental health is not a static state that it only exists within a child, but is also influenced by the interactions between the child and his or her environment. Thus, integrating SEL into teaching practices will not only enhance social and emotional skills in the individual child, but will also help to create safe and supportive environments in which all children feel they belong, reduce the stigma of mental health difficulties, and encourage help seeking when children need it, promoting what mental well being in, in all children. Our goal is that social emotional learning in our district will be deeply ingrained as part of the way students and adults interact both in and out of the classroom, provide students with equitable, supportive and welcoming learning environments, and will be fostered with an intentionality of embedding the related skills, attitudes and behaviors within the curriculum. As a committee, we, we feel it's important that as we discuss SEL and implementing curricula across grade bands, to use our district's mission and vision, as well as our portrait of a graduate as our guide. These are our end goals. So how do we take that portrait of a graduate and make it come alive? How do we create a consistent experience and a set of tools and competencies for our students? It truly starts with data. We first need to be able to assess where our students are, to be able to set goals for them, and to have the ability to monitor their ongoing progress. So our initial task as a committee was to identify a social emotional screening tool that would allow us to measure those skills and attributes as outlined in the portrait of a graduate. In choosing a screener, we were looking for one that was easy to administer and score, one that was research-based and one that measured the core components of SEL as outlined by the Collaborative for Academic, Social and Emotional Learning. After examining like eight to nine screening tools, we found one tool, Panorama, was best aligned with our mission, vision, and portrait of a graduate. And just to give you a sense of that alignment, as you can see on this slide, um, on the left-hand side of the slide, a number of the skills and attributes highlighted in our portrait of a graduate are, are noted. And on the right side of the slide are the areas that are covered on Panorama's screening tool. So you can see all the check marks uh, indicating that there's, there's a strong alignment between those two things. Um, and in the next, slide here. <laughs> um, on the right hand side, uh, or on the left hand side, I'm sorry, um, are the frames for East Penn's vision for equity. And on the right side are the topics that are assessed through Panorama's screening tool. So again, there's a, there's a strong alignment. So to reiterate, Panorama provided us with an SEL and well being tool, baseline data tool that we would use to collect data from our students and our stakeholders. Through this survey identification process, Panorama shared their ability not only to support our district in collecting this data, but also to be able to pull key academic and behavioral information into one place.
This screenshot provides you an example of Panorama's dashboard. While the dashboard is small, the important highlights include the ability to look at academics, social, emotional, and behavioral school-wide trends, the ability to disaggregate data by subgroups, and the ability to examine the whole child as an individual and as part of a larger community. As with any undertaking, professional learning is the cornerstone of successful implementation. Professional staff will learn how to move from interpreting SEL data to taking action. They will also learn how to use the built-in playbook that Panorama provides that contains strategies to support the tenets of SEL. Up until this point, we've talked about collecting the data and the data warehouse. But once we build that pro professional capacity, our committee will proceed on selecting a well-designed classroom-based program that systematically promotes students' and social and emotional competence and provides opportunity for practice. Our plan is to expand our committee for program selection to include student and parent voice. Know that program selection is not a one-size-fits-all. It is likely that programs may differ at each grade level band in order to align to the needs of the students, teachers, and school priorities. This potential programming is projected to cost $65,000. To summarize, our proposed timeline includes survey administration in June to students only. The goal for the end of the year surveys will be to inform strategic planning for the fall and ground professional development leading into the upcoming school year by using student voice data. It will also give us longitudinal data for when we administer the survey topics during the 21-22 school year. In the fall, our committee will vet and choose programs. In the spring, we will tentatively pilot programs in some buildings and or grade levels in anticipation of potential full implementation for the 22-23 school year. On behalf of the SEL committee, we appreciate your support as we prioritize the needs for explicit SEL programming so that our students possess the skills necessary to thrive as learners and contributors to a global society. And at this point, we can take any questions. Thank you. Uh, we'll open it up to board members. Uh, Dr. Munson. Yes, thank you. I mean, we're asking questions about um, all of the budget restorations, right? Or is it just social emotional learning? Any of the budget restorations we discussed. Okay, so um, so thank you for that, and I'm I'm glad that the this you know includes a number of things that that you know got cut um, in last year. I guess my first question is precisely that. I mean, this. This is listed as a budget restoration, but the presentation made it sound like this was something completely new for the district. So is this proposal, the $65,000 proposal new, or is it something that was in last year's budget that, that got cut? No, you are accurate, Dr. Munson. The, the, while SEL work, social emotional learning work has occurred in the organization there. We did not, and we do not have a program. So therefore this would be an, a, a new program for the district. Okay. And is that a, is that estimate of the cost a recurring cost or is this the one-time startup cost? Dr. Munson, once we are able to vet programs, I can have a better, uh, I would be able to better answer that question for you, but it's really important for us to choose a program based on our data. And so until we go through that entire process, uh, we, won't, we won't know. Okay. Um, I guess the other question I had is a more general one. I was hoping you could say a little bit more about how this integrates with all of the other programs that we have in our classrooms. And, and I asked that because, you know, some of the, some of what you presented, right, sounds like SEL is being conceptualized as a subject, right? Like math or language arts um, that, you know, you find out best practices. And then this is another thing that you devote time to um, when you're not doing math or, 
or science or whatever it is. Um, that's never been my understanding of what social emotional learning is. And so could you either educate me that really that that's the best way to look at it or um, explain how this differs from another subject? I can answer that one. So there are a couple of ways to go about social emo emotional learning um, and how we integrate it into our schools. One way is the explicit programming, which we talked about a little bit tonight. And th what that allows, it allows our district, our families, our parents, our students to have a cohesive understanding and use the same language when we're talking about social emotional learning so that we can transfer those skills from the ex explicit instruction to the in the moment um, times when things are happening. And the other way to do that is just what you said, which is take social emotional learning and integrate it into curriculum right into social studies and science. Um, so that is really one of the reasons why we want to look at the data first and also look at our grade level bands because it may make sense to do it different ways depending on our age levels. Great, thank you. Um, so what I just, to make sure I understand what you're saying, um, you're saying that it could actually be done either way as a subject or sort of completely integrated and that right now your team is agnostic as to what the best approach is. Um, once you've collected more data, you'll, you'll have a better sense of what is best. Is that fair? That is, correct. that is correct. I don't know that I would call it a subject as much as many lessons on um, how to uh, self-manage, how to be socially aware. So those kinds of mini lessons that then we would, uh, that students would apply in the moment during the day. Okay, great. Um, my other question actually had to do with the, um, the reading seminar position at the high school. So, um, so this is a sort of um, a, a language arts support role. Um, it's not, it, 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 it's not directly focused on um, students with disabilities, but a more general population where there are deficits in language arts based on what they've already received in um, their grade level language arts class. Is that, do, do I, am I understanding that correctly? That's correct. Okay. So is that, I, I know that as you had mentioned, there were four teacher positions cut at the high school last year. Was this type of position one of those positions? A language no. arts position. Sorry. Go ahead, Chris. The positions that were cut were um, were not intervention type positions. Okay. So once this once this is restored, then I, I guess what what plan, if any, is there to restore teaching positions to the sort of presumably larger proportion of of total students? Um, who still have fewer teachers than they did a year ago. So I think um, Dr. Karras is on right now, but I think on the 26th, our intention is to share with you more of a long range plan. This is a position that we are certain, especially now after the pandemic, we absolutely need, um, but there will be a longer range plan shared again in preparation for the 26th. Okay, I, I mean, I so I mean, it, it sounds great, and uh, you know, I, I uh, suspect I won't be contradicted when I, I, you know, when I say I'm very supportive of, um, you know, of the need for this kind of remediation or or, or support position. Um, in addition to that, I do worry a little bit about, um, you know, I, th I think that we're often very good at looking at what the the, the sort of the students who are accelerated and are at the sort of uh, top of our academic distribution need. And I think we spend a lot of time and focus um, on students who need extra help and so forth. Um, but I, I worry a little bit that the, the large number of students in the middle, particularly at a very large school like Amer Emmaus High School, that they can sometimes slip through the cracks thus necessitating even more remediation. And so I just hope that, um, that, that those issues are on the table as well and that we don't wait to provide the supports that we need for, let's call it your average student um, until it's too late and, and, and we need to institute all kinds of extra supports. So th th I have no more questions. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Dr. Munson. Uh, Mr. Jankowski. Thank you. Um, th thank you for, for the updates today. Um, it's nice to know that we're, we're in a process where we're looking to restore and, and grow programs instead of a year ago when we were looking to reduce. So it feels good. Um, my, my questions today relate to the social and emotional learning uh, pr presentation. And uh, thank you, Dr. Munson, for asking some of the questions I I had also uh, was interested in. But namely, my, my interest is really more, you know, I'm looking to get more information around how, how, how you know, what the expectations are for how this, this program will work you know the, the the skills and attributes that 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 were discussed and i mean those those clearly are skills and attributes we want we want for all of our students um so you know and and and, and you know you said you know we don't want this to be a re, we we want to be in a position where we're we're reacting we want to we want to be in front of situations but it seems like reacting is it, it, it is an it is a byproduct of, of this in any event, I mean, there are situations where we have to react that it might not be as apparent. So I guess my question is, you know, someone along the lines of what Dr. Munson was asking, I mean, well, this is the uh, intent that this program will be built into the general curriculum structure for how teachers are, are educating our students and, and interacting with our students with, with then a subset of that to for further interaction and attention to those who may be in greater need for this kind of support. Because like I said, I mean, every student should be prepared with these skills and attributes by the time they graduate high school. So I would hate to see there being, you know, while there is a need for a focus for those students who, who, who are, you know, have you know, specific situations to be addressed, you know, I think we want the baseline for all of our students with then a, a more intense focus on those who are even in more need. I mean, is, is that kind of where you're looking to go with this program? I, I think you really hit the nail on the head because um, ultimately, you know, like our, our interventions for academics, we would be looking at, you know, tiered supports for students, but, you know, the same way it is for academics, we want to have a strong core. So we first need a really strong social emotional learning curriculum. And then, you know, so that we are meeting those needs of, of all our students and trying to grow towards those attributes that we want them to have by the time they graduate. Um, but in, in doing so, you're right, there's always, there's always some reactivity that we have to have, right? Because, you know, problems grow and, and we need to address them. Um, and, you know, we really do have a lot of supports in place currently that are very reactive. And so I, I anticipate that we would grow those, um, you know, those different tiers of intervention and support as we grow this SEL program uh, district-wide. And where the, the, you know, the $65,000 budget amount that you've identified, what, what's that based on? Because it seems like that this has this has the potential of you know being a lot more if we're going to get into multiple tiers and, and grow this program, um, you know, based on your presentation, which I think is fabulous, and I'm fully in support of this. But but you know, my, my question whether we're we're really putting an accurate dollar amount on this for you know future future budgets and what what our real expectations should be. Yeah, what we did was we uh, looked at some of the most, and I'm going to use the word popular, the, what some of the most popular SEL programs that are out there right now, um, just to get an idea of what the potential costs could be. Understand that some programs are K-8, some are K-6, some are 9-12. So and again, until we look um, at our data and determine the best course of action at each grade level, each grade level band, um, we won't know exactly the cost, but we chose what we believed was the um, closest aligned cost to um, what we intend to do. Okay. Thank you. No, this is really helpful. I mean, you know, I hope the data is, is useful and, and helps us, you know, set the path forward for, for this program. So, you know, thanks again for your presentation and good luck. Thank you, Mr. Jankowski. Uh, Mr. Smith? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so 
my my question is um well first of all i'm excited to see that we have such a strong focus um coming in uh on on sel um and my my questions are really uh, short at first and i have some thoughts um but they're directed they're panorama specific um with a little bit of experience um, using panorama myself um i was happy to see that that is going to be our data collection tool um it's it's generally pretty easy to use and it's pretty powerful. Um, but the, the two questions I had was, and, then, and I'm pretty sure I understand this, so I just want to clarify. Um, one, is it going to be administered to all students K-12 and, and all of our students are going to be completing the survey? And we haven't yet done the survey. Um, so is there, and I saw there's some PD scheduled for after the survey, but is there any PD that's um, going to be scheduled for or planned for just the administration of the survey to the students? And I have some follow up thoughts, but I was going to put those two out first. Great question. I'm going to liken the administration of the panorama survey to uh, Bright Bites, which we did a couple of years ago. We are, um, we are told that the actual administration is very easy. Students will receive their own unique user ID and they will, able to simply, they will be able to simply log right onto the platform. It should take about 15 minutes. And our youngest students, there will be voice, they will be able to hear the questions be able to click so that they can hear the answers. And so we will have um, our survey results will be K, will be K-12. We do have some control over the um, tenets of social emotional learning that we, act, we, we choose to ask questions on. We don't need to uh, focus on every single tenant, but we can hyper-focus on a few that we believe we would, we would like to begin with. And then what we would use that data for would be for our leadership teams and also to strategically plan moving into the upcoming school year. What I envision August uh, looking like would be more about using the Panorama platform in and of itself, how to navigate the platform, how to look at individual student data, your class data, your school data. And then after we administer again and we start to have that longitudinal data, then we can start to talk about how we take our data and put it in and, and move to the actionable pieces, which will then include some more professional learning. So. My hope is that we would have some professional learning in August that would revolve around the use of the platform. Okay, I, my, my concern really wasn't necessarily related to the PD side in the okay. summer. I, I'm sure there's, there's some very powerful and meaningful experiences that are gonna take place there. Um, my concern, and you kind of actually touched on it um, a little bit already, was in the administration of the survey for our youngest students and um, our students who have who may have some um, special learning needs and may have some um, trouble, um, you know, interpreting meaning behind questions or the purpose of why the uh, survey is even even being administered. Um, sometimes, in uh, past experience, it it's been very labor intensive, especially to, to administer for our primary students, our K three students. Um, because, you know, they're, um, especially if it's uh, on a computer and it's, uh, you know, a set of 15 questions and they're just kind of taking it. I'm glad to, glad to hear that it's got an audio component to it. So that, that's obviously pretty critical. Um, but when you've got a class of students and they're taking this 15 minute um, survey at their own pace, um, you, you're going to have students that are at all sorts of different locations that are going to need support and saying, okay, I, so I've heard the question. I still don't know exactly what that question means. And I, number uh, two is my favorite number. So I'm going to pick two. Like that's going to be the, that, that we don't want that. I know that nobody wants that, but that's just a, a concern that not necessarily that um, I really have is an expectation that that might be something that would happen, but just something to be aware of. Um, to make sure that we have the data that we have and the data that we are data we're able to collect represents um, the true need of those students and is not, um, you know, affected by misinterpretation misinterpretation on the part of um, students just because they're so young and 
don't have any sort of um, background knowledge of what they're being asked to do. Um, and on the other side, we don't want it to be um, affected by overcoaching on the part of the adult that's administering the, the survey tool so that, um, you know, students are saying, well, I like Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, and -so, and they seem to like emphasize this one particular option, so I'm gonna pick that one. Meanwhile, they just emphasize it because that was the one of the four options that um, kids didn't really have a background knowledge on. So that's kind of the, my, my background and my whole line of thinking here right now is that we wanna make sure that um, all of those things are considered heading into the administration and maybe there, maybe we need some PD there just on that portion um, before we even give the survey, so we can make sure in the back end we have as much meaningful data as we possibly can have. That's great feedback. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, Ms. Winch. Hi, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I'm so excited about this. Um, this is one of the things I've always hoped for our district to do, and I'm so tickled pink that this is happening in real life. Um, I want to commend the members of your committee. I am I personally know several of them that have helped some of my children with some very significant needs, and I have personally the utmost trust in them to help you come up with the best programming for this district. So thank you very much for picking up some, or I assume that you picked them out or recommended these folks. They're very, very good. Um, I just have a couple of questions. Um, I see that you the estimated um, cost is 65,000. Um, does that include Panorama or is that just the programming? Because I don't believe I saw something that, that separated the two. Yes. We have we currently have a data warehouse that does not include SEL data. And so what Panorama will do will, will be replace that data warehouse. So it will be no additional cost. We already have the funds in the budget for the Panorama piece. Cool. Very cool. Um, I also wanted to just push that I really appreciate the idea of an integrated I think Ms. Winch uh, froze. I don't know if you can uh, hear me, uh, if you wanna um, stop your video fee feed and see if that helps. Um, really hope that you find a, uh, um, are you not hearing me? Uh, we start right when you got to, in, I think you were gonna say integrated. All um, right, froze. This every time I talk, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn off my, my uh, video and you'll just have to imagine me talking, hold on. Can you hear me better just a little bit? Yes. Okay, so I just wanted to say, I appreciate the integrated um, uh, programming option or thought of, of the path of going on to that. Um, having a, a district community and family all on the same page will absolutely amplify the effects of the SEL skills and extend even further than just our students, but also to our district community and family. So I, I, I'm all in favor of um, an integrated program. The only thing I'm, I'm concerned about, and maybe this will come up next month, um, is that there seems, to, there seems to be an immediate need um, for the 21-22 school year. So it feels like there's a gap. It's unfortunately, we didn't start this a year earlier. Um, is there any kind of programming thoughts that we might uh, see for the 21-22 school year? Well, one of the things that I, I really want to emphasize is that a lot of social emotional learning work is already happening in our buildings through our counselors, through our teachers, through our psychologists. What, what we're uh, proposing here is to make it cohesive and then to, so that we're all on the same, as you said, Ms. Winch, that we're all on the same page and that we're all, that the kids are having that same sort of experience so that they can move through our grades and have those same that same skill set that we can all draw upon. 
Um, so there are several there are several uh, programs that are already in place that support mental health. And I believe Mrs. Campbell may have provided you with an extensive list by school. Can I, maybe we lost her. Ms. No, Wayne? I'm here. Oh. I'm here. Okay. Thank you so much. I don't remember specifically seeing a list, but I, I know I knew that there was some programming. I just wasn't sure if there was anything that was specifically going to happen differently for the 21-22 school year. So thank you very much. I, I, I'm very excited about this. Thank you, Ms. Winch. Uh, Ms. Bowman? Yes, thank you. Um, again, I'll um, echo what other people have said. Uh, definitely um, needed uh, to move in this direction. And, um, you know, unfortunately, with the, the climate that we're in now, um, needed more than ever. Um, I, I still, um, even though you sort of answered this question, it's still a little hazy in my mind of what this actually looks like. And you mentioned that there were some popular programs out there. Would you be able to just describe like what it is, um, how this will look in schools um, as a parent, like, or as um, a student, like, what will they notice that's different? Well, depending on the program, um, it, we, we would approach it differently. So for example, Leader in Me is a program that some schools use. Um, and that is training for, our, that is explicit instruction for our, our students, but also for our adults. And they go through an extensive training as well. Second step is also another program that is, that is out there. Mind Up is a program that's out there. And so again, depending on the route in which we go, um, would depend on how we would implement. Okay. In, in, in many cases, there are um, learning topics or units that are taught by, you know, taught by the classroom teacher. And then there's also provisions for how to integrate those into topics in social studies and, you know, ELA or things like that. So again, I mean, of course, it depends on the curricula, but um, it definitely, there are, um, there, there's sort of like an overarching lesson a lot of times and then ways of continuing that discussion and integration into other subject areas. So we don't wanna just teach it once and say, okay, good, you've got that skill, right? Like we wanna mm -hmm. keep circling back and applying it in different ways. So, but, but certainly we wanna teach it with intentionality. Um, and that's something that, you know, we do right now through our school counselors teaching to our, to our classes and, um, you know, through, through some of the, I think in some of the schools, second step is in, in effect right now. Um, but ultimately we want to kind of unify that so that everyone is getting those lessons that, you know, I'm sort of speaking more at the moment to elementary, um, cause that's my area, but, um, that, you know, everybody is getting those specific skill lessons and then building on them through other, you know, other curricula and other domains. Okay. I, I guess what I'm asking though is like, okay, on the elementary level, would this be something like a special, is it something that's integrated into the health curriculum uh, or on the middle level, does it replace um, Hive? I, I don't know what they call what you have at IRE, but there's a time during the day where you were doing an anti-bullying program for it, for example, like when does it come into the day? Uh, like you had mentioned that it could be integrated into other curriculums, but when is the main time that it's taught? Mrs. Bowman, at the secondary level, we think that advisory is going to be a great vehicle for the SEL program that's put into place. Not knowing what that is at this time, that's mm -hmm. hard to answer, but we see this less, I mean, again, we want all of our staff to be trained, mm -hmm. but that advisory would be the main mechanism in grades six through 12, which right now we have a middle level use of time that is meeting mm -hmm. to try to determine how they can best meet that need at the middle level. Okay. And ultimately, we've discussed at the elementary level that, you know, we have one cycle day where there isn't a special, there are four specials and five cycle days. So, you know, that time could be utilized, you know, that's a, that's a strong possibility that we may use that as, you know, our, maybe our initial lesson time might be that, that fifth kind of uh, specialist day. Um, but again, you know, until we sort of have the program map in front of us to say, what do we need to do? It, um, it's hard to kind of determine those specifics. Okay, um, thank you. And then the, the price tag that you gave, you said it was an estimate, but the idea is that that is the cost of a curriculum or is there a person involved? Like a staff position? There's no, there's no person involved. We absolutely would use our existing uh, professional staff 
uh, to deliver any sort of programming because it's, it's just so important that we all understand the language so that we are, help, we are able to help students in the moment. Okay, so when you say that, that's, uh, you mentioned, I'm just trying to figure out what that cost covers. Is it like materials one time? Yes. Or is, yeah, okay. It would be materials, resources okay. and materials. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, it, it, this has come up before it, it, where I'm like very much in favor of, of where the district is moving, but we're being asked to consider something that's um, not all the way figured out. Um, and then, um, but still kind of vote on it before it's figured out, um, including the price tag. And I, I am, I will say I'm, I'm quite uncomfortable with that um, because I don't know what I'm voting for. Um, and so I would hope that maybe as the budget discussion moves forward, maybe we could get, um, I don't know if it's possible, but get more details or have it, um, come into sharper focus for us. Um, I do have a couple questions about the other positions. Um, one, I, I'm just trying to make sure I didn't misunderstand something. On the elementary level position, when you were talking about the cyber charter um, issues and trying to bring students back, but I wasn't sure how that related to the position. Is it more that the position is designed to reduce class size or keep class size from growing too big or is there something else going on there? It would potentially be to um, create an extra section where we have unusually large class sizes. Okay, great. That's what I thought. Okay. The other piece, um, um, Mrs. Bowman, if I could just reflect, and I don't want to interrupt your yeah. thought on the, okay. personnel, uh, the personnel questions, but just in response, um, and Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do know that in preparation for our board presentations, with regard to the SEL, the actual program, like the instructional resources and materials. Um, there are a few key high quality research-based programs out there. And so, you know, our team has already done a whole lot of groundwork and preliminary look at programs. And the cost that we're bringing forth to you is the cost of the most expensive program. So, um, you know, this is this is not like we're taking a shot in the dark here and we think it could be about 65,000 when in reality we come back and a program's double that. Like we felt as if we were being, um, you know, actually giving you, giving the board sort of the most expensive program. And again, ultimately it's about having the funds available for the program so that we can be methodical and intentional in terms of rolling that program out. And I, I appreciate your observation in terms of maybe feeling like you're having to commit to something, but ultimately you're really committing to support for a program, recognizing that we believe very strongly that a program should be needs driven, hence the need for the, the assessment first. Um, and then empowering that core group of people who have, who have been investing in the work of social emotional learning to actually analyze that student data and say, okay, which program best fits those needs. So I wanted to just, you know, hopefully give you a little reassurance in terms of um, that the committee really has done an extensive amount of background and work to be able to bring forth a proposal. All right, thank you. Um, and I think this is my last question, um, was just about the secondary reading position. Do we have an estimate or will that come later after course selection happens in terms of how many units that we'll need, um, like whether this, um, is absolutely a full-time position versus a part-time position versus maybe a contract position? Like, do you already know that it, um, that you'll probably have so many classrooms? classes, I'm sorry, that need to be taught. We anticipate that we will have a, a need for a full-time teacher and that this all of the periods will be utilized to support students. Okay, all right. Um, and I think that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Uh, Dr. Levinson. Thank you, Dr. Bakker. Um, so I'd like to just echo the feedback that many of my colleagues have, have already stated that, um, that, that I do support, you know, what's been presented here, and, and there has 
you know, a need has been demonstrated. And, and again, you know, I, I, do, I do share the enthusiasm for being in a position to restore the, the things that, that we held back from, from the prior year or still. So I'm happy to see that. Um, I do have, a, I guess, a, just a, a specific question about, about the implementation of the, of the SEL uh, program. And, and, and forgive me if this is something that, that was already covered in, in the discussion or the presentation. Um, so, so as I understand, you know, the students are going to do are going to do surveys, and they're going to learn, uh, you know, uh, throughout what's been integrated uh, in, into the various programs. But, but ultimately, there's going to be information and, and data out there. And so, I, I'm just wondering if you could clarify for me who's who's going to be responsible for analyzing and assessing the data. Um, you know, is it going to be teachers, counselors, et cetera? And then ultimately, who's formulating the response plan or the program assignments for individual students? So right now, we have um, analyzing data is a goes from the teacher perspective all the way up through the district perspective. In other words, we have teachers looking at individual students. We have them. We have teachers analyzing data from their classrooms, and then it goes to the school level and then to the district level. So. So looking at this data will happen at all of those different levels. And that's the wonderful thing about Panorama. We're able to disaggregate data by subgroups. We're able to look at school data as from a district perspective, we can get a sense of the culture and the climate even at the district level. When we drill down to a specific student, that likely will happen with uh, teacher groups and uh, core teams and buildings. And that's when, um, depending on, on the data, that's when we would have in, uh, instructional specialists, gui uh, guide school counselors, psychologists also involved in that process. And, and to circle back to something Noelle said earlier, that's when we begin to take that tiered approach on how we, how we start to approach how we can help individual students be more successful. Okay. So is this something that, that, that that's basically, uh, you know, added to the, to the responsibilities of, of, of the teachers and, and other other members of the, of the district in terms of, of looking at, at, at student needs, or is this kind of taking the place of some other things that we're already doing um, uh, to, yeah. uh, to, again, assess student needs? I, I wouldn't say it's taking the place. What I would say is that it is, it's adding the layer of social emotional learning onto the academic piece. So now you're, you're seeing the whole child. And so when you see some academic uh, red flags, perhaps you're looking at the social emotional data alongside with that, that really can help you understand the root cause um, as to why perhaps a student is struggling in math per se. And so that's where we're going to be able to take those two pieces in tandem. And it really is going to tell a story about our students and help us better support them. So it wouldn't be additional as much as it would be taking those two things and having a better picture of our students. Okay. Well, is this something that could come pretty quickly, for instance, if you say, all right, you know, I got a student that's struggling here, let me call up Panorama and, and the student, and then, you know, within a matter of, you know, you know, a few seconds or whatever, you can see, oh, I can understand why the student is struggling. Yes, it's a live dashboard, so it will okay. refresh every night. Okay. And, and just to give you like a, a concrete example, I could say I have six students in my class who are struggling with math. How many of them are struggling with self-regulation skills? So how many of them might be struggling to pay attention in the classroom or might be struggling with their, you know, just general, uh, you know, functioning and behavior in the classroom? So I might pull those, that list and discover that three of them actually have, you know, that combination of they're struggling in math, they have self-regulation issues. So now we're going to look at what types of things can we do to target that as a skill we need to work on that self-regulation. We know we need to work on the math, but we also need to work on that self-regulation and look at the bigger picture of how we can help, you know, the skills improve overall. Well, using your example then, so, so how, how is that self-regulation issue actually diagnosed for the student? Does that come through the student-driven surveys or, or is that, or have, have, the, have the teachers somehow also added data to the whole picture? Through, through the surveys that we, we would conduct through Panorama. Okay, and then how frequent was that again? I know, I know we're, there's a fall. Three, to, three times per year. Three times per year, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, well, thank you for addressing my questions. And again, uh, I, I appreciate all the information that's presented. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Levinson. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your presentation on all the district priorities, uh, but most importantly, I think it's one of the toughest things is to grasp new programs. And I think between the presentation and your answers uh, to the other uh, board members, I think I have a better picture of, of, of um, what's uh, occurring with the uh, special, social emotional learning program. And uh, I'm in favor of this, uh, this approach. I think it's a good idea for the, for the district. Thank you very much. Moving on to the, I don't see any other questions. Moving on to the district update. Um, Mrs. Campbell. Yes, thank you. We successfully welcome back our kindergarten through eighth grade students for five day a week instruction. Um, as you know, last week was really the first week in which we had um, at the elementary level, our K to five students back, as well as last Thursday, our middle school students returned for the five day a week instruction. And as various members of our admin team were visiting buildings over the past week, we found that both students and staff are equally excited to be back five days a week. And again, for, from a student perspective, as well as from a staff perspective. And I, I wanted to take a moment this evening just to recognize the, the efforts of our administrative, as well as our teaching and our support staff, as well as STA for their outstanding work in preparing for a safe return to school for all students at, at all levels. In particular, our building and district administrators um, continued to monitor class enrollments and make adjustments when necessary. Our facilities departments helped to rearrange classrooms, bring furniture out of storage since that had been placed there since August. Um, helped work with building principals to make room for safe eating spaces. We have STA who verified bus rosters so that our buses are not overcrowded. Our cafeteria employees who have been feeding our students all year, both in school and also with our remote lunch pickup that continues, as well as our teaching and our support staff who have continued to demonstrate remarkable flexibility in not only preparing their classrooms, but at times maybe giving up their classrooms and being flexible in spaces so that we can accommodate all students safely in our buildings. Without a doubt, all of this work was well worth it when we see our students um, back five days a week. I also wanted to take a moment to thank our families and our students and remember that we all as a school community have a role in adhering to our COVID protocol so that we can protect ourselves and each other and minimize our school closures due to COVID cases. And that really serves as a segue um, to the, the next update that I wanna give. Specifically just last week, the Pennsylvania Department of Health and the Pennsylvania Department of Education jointly updated their closure recommendations um, for schools in response to COVID cases. In particular, the state departments have reduced the duration of school closures in response to those positive cases. An example that I'll give is, for example, for buildings that, have, um, that the state has defined as a medium-sized building. For those buildings that have four to six positive COVID cases in a 14 day period of time, while in substantial level of spread, previously this, the departments warranted a closure from three to seven days. Now under the revised guidelines, again, a medium sized building with four to six positive cases would have to close for two to three days. And so in all situations, the duration of a recommended school closure has been shortened. The state also reiterated again, the purpose of a building closure. The purpose of such a closure is so that schools can appropriately contact trace um, and make determinations as to any potential in school spread. And also so that we have appropriate time for cleaning and disinfecting and so Again, I just wanted to communicate with the board as well as the public and let them know that the guidelines from the state departments have been updated um, and really have lessened the duration of potential school closures. Finally, I have um, a few celebrations and recognitions that I always enjoy making. First, congratulations to Dr. Michael Kelly. Um, 
as you know, Dr. Kelly is our principal at Iyer Middle School, and just recently he earned his doctorate in educational leadership from Widener University. Also, congratulations to Mrs. Kristen Grimm, who is a guidance counselor at Emmaus High School, and she was recently named the Lehigh County School Counselor of the Year. Last week, hopefully, many members of our school community took an opportunity to vote for Lower McCungie Middle School's What's So Cool About Manufacturing video that they produced through the What's So Cool About Manufacturing contest. And as, as a reminder about the What's So Cool About Manufacturing, it's an opportunity for middle school students across the state to partner with local manufacturers to learn about careers in manufacturing. Student teams creatively demonstrate their collaboration and learning through a video. And this year, Lower McCungie Middle School, under the guidance of Mrs. Bolrus, partnered with Lutron Electronics. So last week was the community voting on the student videos for Lehigh County Schools. So please stay tuned to find out the video award winners. We'll certainly keep you updated. And finally, the Emmaus Public Library is hosting the first annual Tea Time at the Library featuring an 18-hole eight, mini golf course inside the library on April 23rd and 24th. So this should be a fun event. And it appears that the Shoemaker Elementary Art students are making decorations for each hole. And I recently learned that my fourth grader volunteered the Campbell family for one of the holes. And so it looks like we'll be making be decorating a one of the golf holes. So I and that sounds like an, a, a fun activity for our families to come out and enjoy April 23rd and 24th. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Campbell. Uh, I see we have a couple of questions from the board. Uh, Mr. Champagne. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Campbell. I, it's a related question to in-person instruction and it has to do with um, LCTI. I you know, was gonna, in my report the, this evening, on LCTI, you know, they are going back to four-day instruction. Uh, they started actually today with uh, Northern Lehigh, Southern Lehigh, and Whitehall. But what I was surprised to see is that Parkland and East Penn are going to remain in hybrid. So I'm wondering why those students who could go back on a four-day basis aren't. And then especially if students, for example, are in the academic center and then transition to their lab class in the afternoon, if they are eligible to be there for the four days. Uh, so, and if, or if, is it a transportation related issue? What is the real reason why students can't take advantage of that four day instruction? I see that Dr. Kiras is here and, and I'm gonna say it's actually a combination of several of the factors that you mentioned, but Dr. Kiras, are you able to um, specifically mention um, sort of the factors that we had to consider in East Penn with regard to that decision? Uh, sure, I am. Um, any student that is currently attending Emmaus High School who is a five day a week student and goes to LCTI is attending five day or four days a week as of um, April 8th. Um, and we're looking at the, at the feasibility of um, inviting our, um, our hybrid students. It just may require a midday bus run. And I'm not sure um, where we were with that, uh, but we had, we had been discussing the feasibility of trying to get um, our students on their remote days to be able to be transported up to LCTI. So it, it's kind of in the works. Okay, I'm, I'm not clear. You've mentioned that certain students are able to go up there now for the four-day instruction and others yes. are not. Who, who so, is eligible now and, who, and why are they eligible and why are others are not eligible? So um, we have some students attending five days a week. Um, all of our students with IEPs, 504s, English language learners um, have already been invited to um, attend Emmaus High School five days a week. And so if they've taken advantage of that opportunity and they attend LCTI, they are going up to LCTI four days a week. Okay. Um, we're also expanding that to other students who are academically at risk. So we're evaluating those students case by case and trying to get more students who need to be with us, with us for longer periods. And then there's the other group of students who are currently hybrid students who only attend Domainus High School two or three days a week, who as of just a few days ago may have the opportunity to go up to LCTI 
four days a week, even though they are remote at Emmaus High School on those days. And those students would require a midday bus run to get to campus, to get up to LCTI. So we've started exploring that. Um, but I don't know if, if uh, Ms. Whitman or, or Mrs. Campbell wants to speak to that. No, so we, we, we have the funding to do the transport. So now it's a matter of working with LCTI to make sure that, again, they're able to accommodate how the number of students who express an interest in being. So it's just a course of preparation right at this point to find out how many students are actually wanna go up to the, for the four day program. Right, so we were prioritizing those students who we had invited back for five days. As I said, those students are already going. And now we move to the question of whether or not students who are currently hybrid want to go up there for the other other days. But if there are, or if there are students that are attending the academic center or that were attending the academic center even in a hybrid mode and, the, and then going to their lab class even in a hybrid mode, can they go now? Four day, four, 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 four day instruction? We're trying to determine whether LCTI can accommodate the students and trying to identify which ones want to do that. Including those that were taking the academics and their academics from mm -hmm. LCTI. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm a little concerned. I, I have a question, why can't they accommodate them if they already were? I mean, they were accommodating them in the academic center and in the lab classes. So why wouldn't they be able to do it now? So I, and that's a little perplexing to me. I don't believe that LCTI has ever operated. I mean, you can correct me, Mr. Champagne, but I don't believe they've operated with a four-day program the entire year. And so my understanding was they had to game out our numbers as well as the other large district in the county to make sure that they could accommodate everybody. And so I think that's why we have a delay of working out the numbers. You might know more than that, of, you know, around the circumstances or than we do, but I understand that we need to work with them to be able to game it out. Yeah, I understand that. I just was curious with like the academic center kids who are already, they're never showing up at Emmaus High School, period, why they couldn't already be going, even though, you know, you have to, I, that's what I'm trying to understand. For example, oh. they never, they never go to Emmaus High School one at all because they're in the academic center for their academics and then they go right to their lab class. So why can't they go now with the other students if they're already, you know, they're never attending uh, Emmaus High School at all? I think they could. We've only known for less than a week that LCTI was able to accommodate students four days a week. So we're still in the process of just determining what that means and how many students they can accommodate from their sending schools. I think it was perhaps only last Thursday that we received the notification that that was officially approved. Okay. All right. Fair enough. I appreciate your support. Yeah. I just, you know, it I, would be wonderful to get them up there as much as we can. So we, we certainly are working on doing that. We just were prioritizing our, our five day a week students to get them up there first. And um, now we'll do, we'll be doing the outreach to the other students. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Champagne. Uh, Ms. Bowman. I think you're on mute still, Ms. Bowman. Thank you. Starting over. Um, I just wanted to follow up on something that I thought could potentially be confusing to the public um, or, or maybe not, but um, just to um, cover all the bases. Um, so when you were mentioning the, um, the new updated Pennsylvania Department of Health, Department of Education guidelines, um, I just wanted to make sure it was clear to the public that that's what we're following now versus what we had been using before. Um, and then I was wondering, because I noticed um, the last time that we had a number of cases and, and some of our buildings had to close, um, many different parents seemed um, kind of surprised by that and maybe not necessarily aware that we have the, the running 14-day um, moving totals on the website. Um, but because like the actual numbers that we're using have changed, I'm wondering if on that site, um, you can make it clear what the number has to get to per building so that people just aren't, they know what the, the number is so that um, as it gets to that total, people are kind of aware, oh, my building might close before the, long before the district has to send out a communication about it. Does, does that uh, make sense? Yes, I will, I will share there is a, as you know, and, and I appreciate your um, 
clarifying or reiterating the message of these are guidelines from the Pennsylvania Department of Health and the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Um, these are not East Penn created guidelines. And so we, like other school districts across the state, are, are adhering to the guidelines. And just as there is a range for the number of days that a building can close or, or should close in response to cases, there is also a range of cases by building size of, of the number of cases that may warrant a closure. Um, and certainly we can, we can share a link on our COVID homepage um, that, that provides that information so that families can see, for example, if, if we're a small building, the range for a school of positive cases that prompt a closure is two to four. So if I'm in a building um, and I see that my child's school has three cases in a small building, I potentially know I have to be mindful that um, a school closure may, may be coming. Um, certainly we can do that. Yeah, I, I think what people may not know is the size of their building. Um, it's kind of obvious what the high school is, I think, but the middle schools are, I, I'm, I'm not, I actually don't know what the size of the middle schools are personally. So I, I can imagine that some other parents may not know as well. Oops, sorry, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. I, I don't see any other questions. So uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. Campbell, for your report. Um, moving on to personnel, I'll entertain a motion for uh, items one through 11 in the personnel exhibit. I haven't seen so moved. Second, Bowman. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Champagne. Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Winch? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motion passes. Um, moving on to business operations, I'll end Dr. 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 Bacher, I apologize for interrupting. If, oh. you, if you don't mind, I'd just like to make a comment in response to the personnel items that were just approved by oh, the board. I'm sorry. That's okay. In particular, the board approved and accepted, I should say, three resignations um, of, in particular, the resignation of Ms. Carraher, Mrs. Decker, and Mrs. Hillenbrand. And in particular, Mrs. Carraher and Mrs. Decker have been uh, health, wellness, fitness teachers in East Penn for many, many years. And certainly um, I know are beloved by their students and really respected tremendously as leaders among their colleagues in the department. Mrs. Hillenbrand likewise is um, an elementary teacher in the organization, most recently teaching third grade at Shoemaker. And you know, anytime that we have retirements, it's, it's very, very much a bittersweet situation. And um, we know that we can fill positions, but I am confident that we will be hard pressed to find educators who are as caring, compassionate, and dedicated to East Penn as these three individuals are. So I just wanted to take a moment and congratulate them on their upcoming retirement um, and really just recognize them for their outstanding commitment and leadership in the organization. Thank you, Mrs. Campbell, for the additional uh, input. Um, moving on now to business operations. Uh, if there are no objections, I'll entertain a motion for items A through C uh, together. Sure, I'm sorry. So Was that Mr. Bird uh, making the motion? Yes. Was there a second? Ms. Champagne second. Mr. Champagne, I believe. Sorry, I didn't hear it. I apologize. Um, uh, discussion, uh, Dr. Levinson. Thank you, Dr. Bacher. Um, again, I'm, I'm curious, always curious about the uh, contract awarding, and I was curious what the budgeted versus actual amount was for the uh, uh, the contract that, that's um, on asphalt paving repairs at IR Middle School and item C. The original budget was 106,000, and uh, the price came in at 81,500. So 
so we're roughly twenty four thousand five hundred below budget. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nusko. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Levinson. Uh, Mr. Jankowski. Thanks. Um, I, a couple of questions on the contracting process here. Uh, you know, the so the the performance and payment bond. Uh, you know, has has blanks in the first recital, which, you know, understanding that we don't have a fully executed agreement yet, um, those I would expect will be filled in, namely the, the date of the agreement and the um, the date of the proposal. Um, so I'm, you know, just want to make sure that we, we have full, fully complete and executed contracts. And then my second question is regarding the agreement itself, which which is dated it's dated March, you know, 2021, and I just find it odd that the um, the payment performance bond was fully executed by, you know, the contractor and the surety prior to having an executed contract and kind of just strange in timing that we have, you know, we'll have a, an executed contract for which the bond um, applies to dated, you know, the bond was dated prior to that going into effect. And I'm, just curious, is, is that our normal process or were they just anxious to sign, get everything signed uh, before it was approved? So it's uh, actually, it is very customary that the bonds are actually signed by the, uh, technically the prospective bidder as part of the submission. So that's standard and customary. Um, the actual signing of the contract itself, probably not so customary, but uh, since it hasn't been signed by the district, it's not really an issue until the board approves it. So I don't, I don't see a problem there. Sure, and, and I, I assume all blanks will be filled in and we'll have a completed set for our records. Correct. All right, thanks. Thank you, uh, seeing no further questions uh, or comments. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Allen, will you call the roll please? Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Winch? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motions pass. <clears throat> uh, moving on to item D, I'll now entertain a motion for acceptance of the $10,000 uh, donation. So moved, Bowman. Levinson seconded. Uh, is there any discussion? No. This is Alan, will you call the roll please? Sorry. Oh, did you, sorry, did you have a question, Ms. Ms. Bowman? Uh, I didn't have a question, I only have a comment, which is thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll please? Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Winch? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motion passes. I know Mrs. Campbell, you had wanted to say some words. Yes, I too, on behalf of the district would like to express my sincere gratitude to Mrs. Dolly Corradetti and the Corradetti family for their incredibly generous donation. The $10,000 will be used to support the Dr. Herman J. Corradetti Academic Hall of Fame Award a prestigious award that is, that is awarded annually to a graduating senior at Emmaus High School for outstanding scholastic achievement. The late Dr. Cordetti, as many of you know, is, is a legend at Emmaus High School, having served as a counselor, an assistant principal, and principal actually on two separate occasions. Um, I had the great pleasure of working with Dr. Cordetti when I was an administrator too here in East Penn and we also worked on several committees together um, throughout the county. He is fondly remembered um, for being an advocate for students, for deeply, for being deeply committed to our East Penn community, and most importantly for being an incredibly kind and compassionate human being. Um, so again, 
I wish to express a, a tremendous amount of gratitude for this great donation in honor of an equally amazing person. Thank you. That's, um, it's good to hear the background on, on stories like this. Um, moving on to uh, curriculum. Uh, I'll entertain a motion if there are no objections to take items A and B together. Jankowski, so moved. Second, Bowman. Is there any discussion or questions? Mrs. Allen, we uh, call the roll, please. Dr. Munson? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Winch? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motions pass. <clears throat> Moving on to other educational entities. Uh, Ms. Bowman, do you have an update for the CLIU? Uh, no, we haven't. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the facilities plan. Yes. Um, I, I can speak to this, though. Um, I actually, at Excuse the last me, meeting... Start the motion, and then I'll have you... Okay, sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll entertain a motion for uh, approval of the CLIU facilities plan. Champagne, so moved. Okay. Second, Second, Bowman. Now, Ms. Bowman, can you uh, provide some comments on the... So yes, um, and I don't know if um, anybody else from the administration um, wants to weigh in on this. Um, I gave a, a brief report on this at the last meeting. Um, I don't believe there at the IU meeting there was no um, controversy over the Lehigh County classrooms. Um, as I mentioned, the IU um, either rents space or uses um, free space that districts provide to them. They do not have any. Um, physical infrastructure of their own. Um, they usually try to keep the classrooms uh, contiguous in a district. So if they have an elementary classroom um, in a district, they'll try to also have a middle school and a high school classroom um, so that the students aren't going from one district to another. Um, and usually when they're opening and closing classrooms, that's like the one of the top things that they consider. Um, so the, in Carbon County, that is why they're moving classrooms from um, Weatherly to Panther Valley, uh, because they had weather, Weatherly District could no longer support all four classrooms. Um, they moved some others out of that district in years past. And um, this is the last of those rooms to be moved over to Panther Valley, um, not without controversy as um, at least one family affected at Weatherly didn't want their child to move. Um, and I don't know of any um, controversy in Lehigh County though for those classrooms. Thank you for the update. Are there any uh, comments, uh, any other comments or questions? Then um, Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll please? Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Winch? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motion passes. Uh, moving on to LCTI. Uh, Mr. Champagne, you have a report? Yes, thank you, Dr. Bacher. As I mentioned earlier, um, we did have a meeting um, of the LCTI uh, Joint Operating Committee. It met on uh, March 24th. Uh, the highlights of that meeting, uh, you know, the, the return to four day instruction was approved. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it starts uh, actually today for Northern Lehigh, Southern Lehigh and Whitehall on the 19th for Catasauqua, Northwest Lehigh and Salisbury and on the 26th for Allentown. Um, and as we discussed earlier, East Penn is evaluating uh, how that will uh, work for, for our, our own students. In addition, um, there was an award of $200,000 from the state for a supplemental equipment grant. Uh, communities and schools gave their annual update and how they have been working with LCTI students on a virtual basis. And it was very 
uh, impressive on how they've been able to keep contact with all the students that they are under their care and uh, help them uh, through this very trying uh, time. Uh, the 21-22 uh, budget was approved by all of the, the sending districts on a vote of 69 yes, one no, and two abstentions. And some good news, Camp LCTI will be occurring this summer, uh, June 21st to June uh, 25th. Uh, more information on exactly how it will be happening uh, to follow. And then also Senior Recognition Night for students at LCTI will be held on May 27th uh, in a virtual um, mode, but uh, uh, a local entity called Digital Feast is providing a is working on providing a series of videos uh, for the ceremony, including award presentations that evening. That's my report. Thank you, Mr. Champagne. Are there any uh, questions or comments uh, on the LCTI report? <clears throat> Seeing none, uh, moving on to uh, discussion item, uh, the National School Board uh, Association Advocacy, Advocacy Institute Online. Uh, is this uh, something that we have to look at um, if people want to attend? Uh, yes, it, it's to determine which board members would want to participate. And when do we need to make the, make um, that? you know what, I, I, I apologize for that. Second, I might be able to. Okay. So there's uh, information there for um, um, uh, people interested in attending the, um, the, uh, the Advocacy Institute. I, um, I imagine, um, Mr. Champagne, are you our uh, NSBA representative now? I've attended the advocacy conference in the past. I don't think I'm in the NSBA okay. representative, but uh, okay. I unfortunately have a conflict at that time, so I will not be able to participate. Okay. Um, Dr. Bacher, I have the uh, registration deadline information. Okay. Uh, for April 30th is the early bird you get. It's, it's at 299 for the per person. Um, you can register then anytime between April 30th and June 9th, and then the cost would be 350. Okay. So, so it's a matter of that $50 savings if you do it. By okay. April 30th. And so we, we should uh, uh, have a motion for people willing, uh, interested in attending at the next meeting. Yes. Right. Okay, um, moving on to announcements. Uh, we had an executive session uh, at 645 uh, where we discussed, uh, before the meeting today, where we discussed personnel and negotiations. Our next regular uh, board meeting is on Monday, April 26th at 730. And I will now entertain a motion for to adjourn. So moved, Bowman. Smith, second. So, uh, Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Winch, can you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Um, yes, of course. Thank you. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.